welcome to the first installment of Speaking of Poetry. I'm Rennie McQuilkin, and today I'm wearing my metaphorical poetry hat. But uh, I am also the publisher of Antrim House, which uh, releases books by poets and uh, memoirists. And uh, we are going to present each month one of our writers uh, for your delectation, and uh, today I get the privilege of being that writer. And before I uh, launch into a few of my own poems about uh, Simsbury, people and places and things, um, I would like to thank uh, Ken Picard, my wonderful producer, uh, who is a man of many talents. Uh, among others, he's a, a fine artist, and uh, you will see his artwork right behind me. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ken, and thank you all for, uh, for listening in. And uh, I'm going to uh, begin with a few poems about uh, Simsbury people, uh, local heroes. Uh, and the uh, first of them uh, is uh, called Drive Through Teller. And uh, you may well remember, I hope, uh, that in the old days one could drive through and uh, encounter an actual human being behind the teller's window. This, uh, this actually was not all that long ago. I was in the car with my dog, and uh, this is what happened. Drive through teller. Dour fist of a face in its bulletproof booth checks my check, suspiciously. Surveillance camera eyeing me. My dog shifts nervously in the passenger seat. Now the drawer with its tokens slides out like a tongue on the wafer of paper within a large beige biscuit. The next one uh, is entitled Long Exposure, and uh, it is for my neighbor uh, at the end of Goodrich Road. And uh, this is Long Exposure. The end of the year blurs and flickers an old film, silent, black and white. But this evening, a corner of the sky is lit as if with strips of colored paper some child has cut up. And an oblong moon's across the way, a star above it for good attendance, all very elementary. I'm walking the dog talking dog with him. When I come upon my neighbor so unpredictably, I barely have time to shift from dog. Don't quite make it. For his part, my neighbor is singing how high, how blue the moon. The dog pauses as if to bay. Must know he's in the picture too. My neighbor and I are in it as well one of those long exposures where nothing moves. And uh, one for Steve Eck Eckwurzel, my tree man. Uh, this makes a reference to Jacob's ladder, which in the Bible is the ladder by which angels come and go between heaven and earth. Tree man. Jacob can have his ladder. Angels, the whole business, give me any day the man with gaffs on his boots, who works his way up a hundred feet of locust, Jane saw hanging behind like a monkey's tail. Give me the man suspended by faith in cinch and line, the man who stands on air with the sun at his back, does what he can, and drops down to earth by a single strand. And one for Leslie Dewey, who died not too long ago, whose uh, flower farm on Terry's Plain Road is a, is a local attraction, and his son uh, still works that farm. Uh, uh, Mr. Dewey, Leslie Dewey, collected Indian artifacts. That was an Indian uh, uh, summer campground, that whole section of Terry's Plain Road above the uh, Farmington River on a, on a slight rise. And those artifacts actually are in the Simsbury Library. Flower Farmer. Last fall, Mr. Dewey wrapped his house with sheets of plastic. 
Lit by headlights, it glittered red and blue. This spring it lists farther. The shingles flap, and you can hear, he says, the tick of water dripping, termites, beetles, mice. As for his greenhouse, it's held up by vines and sprouts patched stovepipes crookedly. All winter, Mr. D cooked his dirt for potting. He's out of sorts today. She's dead, the 57 DeSoto that pumped river to his flowers. Still, it's spring. His dentures sparkle. He's in better shape than that neighbor of his with the heart thing. And there's always the granddaughter. She's a one with glads, a natural with dafts and, and two lips. But a little wild for boys, he's glad to say. Plant her here, she comes up there. Putting in carnations this morning, he found another arrowhead, onyx, an ornamental. He looked it up. Ask to see his Indian stuff, he'll ask you in. Old man, smell, and mildew, and dry rot, and cat stink, and African violets everywhere, furry as an old man's ears. He has, he says, the Indian's cold. Knives, scrapers, axes, mauls. He's proudest of a three-foot pestle stone, the tip worn smooth. According to the museum man, that pestle stone was hung from a sapling to pound seeds. He can see it now. She is something, the girl who works the pestle stone. A sapling pulls it up, the maiden pulls it down. Sapling up, maiden down, grinding lily root. From her face, the granddaughter grins. Mr. D is bent like a tree the pestle stone is done with. But he turns that stone in his hands, in love with whatever works. Darn DeSoto. And now uh, a few seasonal poems. Uh, I'm sure you remember with horror last winter's snow and pulling the snow off the roofs with, uh, with roof racks, with roof rakes and all that. Uh, this one is uh, about that snow and it, it has a flashback to the snows of the 1940s when a uh, neighbor girl and I uh, would mole our way under the front yard because it had about four feet of snow on it. She, was, uh, she had been sent over from England in 1939 to uh, be uh, out of the country when the Blitz began, which it did shortly after. Groundhog Day. What a snow! Whiteouts on the interstates from Ohio to Pennsylvania, 80-plus inches on the ground in Connecticut, and ice on the way. The weather channel is delirious, talking it up. Their man in Pittsburgh is almost dancing with the joy of gusts to 60. I've had it with Jim Cantori. The lot of them have turned off the tube and getting back to work, shoveling out a hundred yards to the street. Now here I am, stalled halfway, small between snow walls and running out of gas. What business does memory have kicking in, kicking up its heels, showing how it was in 41 when it snowed for 40 days upstate, a crisis, said W-H-A-M, when even better than making cities out of building blocks and bombing them to smithereens was mucking through a blizzard with Molly Scarf, sent over from London in 39 when a blitz looked likely mushing to a wall of half-frozen snow looming overhead where the yard had once begun, and tunneling into it as if beneath that no-man's land of white was what we'd waited so long to find. We worked and worked our way in, advancing like moles, digging and carting out snow to open the underground warren we wanted, a shelter so hidden no father or mother or V2 rocket would ever find us. 
and uh, one from Easter time. Because Easter always comes after the first full moon of spring, I'm thinking of putting the Easter moon into a poem, something about the new moon grown ripe as a wood frog's song full throat. Oh, good God, that's awful. Happily, I am interrupted. My wife brings me an orange button dug up in the garden, the undershell of a newborn painted turtle, dime size. It must have hatched during our cold spell from an egg wintered over. Perfect little legs, tail, head, but defunct. We commiserate, and I put the button in the waste basket among wadded up copies of my poem and go on revising, but it's hopeless. I give up. I'm returning to figures on a spreadsheet when I hear in the basket a spondaic scratching among a waste of words, and I dig out the painted, its legs busily making for water. The thrust of its neck is easterly. It was a wonderful moment. Actually, it happened on Easter Day, amazingly enough. Too coincidental for words. And I'm sure you've all uh, seen uh, many times crossing in front of your car or across your backyard or many places the turkeys that have come back to Simsbury. They, uh, they inhabit our woods, and I, I will see in the spring the tom turkeys uh, spreading their tail feathers in a mating display. This is entitled, As the World Turns. He struts and pauses, turns this way and that, the better to give her a gander at his pricked-up tail. Copper-purple feathers fanned out like a straight flush, sun-tipped and translucent. Not looking her way, he comes closer, his checkered side feathers like beige fenders, hiding the mortal feet he goes upon. Bright blue head tucked close to puffed-up steel-blue pectorals. The long strand of his beard dangles orientally, below a red display of waddle. She does not see and does not see, then carelessly rises as if on point, stretches her wings, she has them, and beats the air before she strolls obliviously into the undergrowth. He lowers his fan, picks at mites, then fans his tail out again, pulls in his head, expands his sunstruck meddled chest and meanders casually toward her arch of briars. Uh, I live across the river from Westminster School and often hear the uh, sound of summer school dances drifting across the meadows among the fireflies in the evening. And uh, this is about that. It's entitled Rock band with fireflies. I am too old. All the more reason to love. From a field, floodplain, and river away, the syncopated cadence of the drums, ground of the bass, wordless wail of rock, at the strobe-lit dance of a summer school on its bluff across the Farmington. Love, how the music comes, goes, and comes again in the currents of a cooling night. How it matches the fireflies sparking over the smart weed vetch and rye grass of a spring-fed field and among the small moonstruck willow leaves. The fireflies flashing like an amplifier's green golds, each of them a separate beat, each signaling, I am the one and each one right, like the stars in that other dance overhead, whose fires flare up and fade and flare up again. Behind the uh, Simsbury Airport uh, is a very primitive place. Its name is Pickerel Cove, uh, and it uh, 
is full of uh, very primitive vegetation and wildlife. I go in there to see the big snapping turtles and uh, rafts of wood ducks and uh, blue herons and all sorts of, uh, of wildlife back in there. This is entitled, this is entitled Pickerel Cove for David Morse. Past the local runways with their buzz of Cessnas, beyond the last wind sock, below a cliffside littered with junkers rusting into the earth and pierced by saplings, curls Pickerel Cove, original coil of the river long since gone straight, backwater home to all the life the river is too busy to uh, accommodate. Find your way down, uncover the skiff, use a snag of the stricken sycamore for balance and put in. There's no hurry, this will take time. You are at first a sight for all those little periscopes of lesser painted turtles peering through the scum. Settle in, be patient. Become a part of it. Wait for the bullfrogs to begin again to claim their pads among the pickerel weed and the long sigh of heron wings, the soft clap as they are folded in for the stealth of stilt-legged fishing. Signs you are safe as scenery. It's time to look for a disturbance of the duckweed, a slow counterclockwise revolution of darker algae growing up from a two-foot shell basking just beneath the surface, from which a double-fisted hook-beaked snout lifts a pair of mud-black eyes to take you in. Be still, let yourself be known, and be ready when the snapper sinks, slowly scrapes the bottom of your boat raises it like the first world, setting you down different. Don't be surprised to feel yourself lifted up again in deeper water at the bend, dark clear of algae, home to the imperial carp that show themselves just once a year when two by two they twine, hundreds roiling the water white, their gold-brown black-bordered scales, the huge coins of some ancient culture. This time of year, you'll feel their surge well up like the sudden updraft that catches a small plane unawares and tosses it. Reminder, your welcome here is provisional. As uh, many of you know who plant potatoes, you better get them in before the first hard freeze. Uh, this is a poem in which <clears throat> my wife and I did not get them in, in time. The Digging. It's that time of year, the hedgerows hung with bittersweet potato time. How early the freeze, I'd say, if we were speaking, we are not. We turn our spading forks against the earth, it's stiff. The Reds and Idaho's hard as stone, a total loss. Once it was us against the beetles, blight, whatever was not potato. How they flowered, rows and rows of them in white. Now look, we give it one last try, and there, far down in softer soil, a seam of them, still perfect. One after another, we hold them up to the dying day, kneel down to sift for more. In the dark of earth, I come upon your hand, you mine. And my wife and I <clears throat> found ourselves uh, holding hands like a couple of spuds down there in the earth. That's a good way to make up. This one uh, takes a slight detour to Hartford. In uh, 1956, there was a terrible fire, uh, New Year's Eve, actually, when uh, the uh, 
cathedral, St. Joseph's uh, Cathedral, burned to the ground. Uh, and now, of course, there's a, there's a new one there. But this was an old Romanesque and very beautiful building. And uh, I need to thank uh, Fran McNally for uh, telling me this story and making it all very vivid to me. There's an epigraph to the poem from the book of Exodus, which is this. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire that is uh, leading the chosen people out of Egypt. Cathedral Fire, 1956. When I got there, St. Joseph's was too far gone to be saved. A column of smoke from afar and closer, a pillar of fire. Then the rose window blossomed, exploded. A whirlwind arose and from the belfry, bells, bells ringing their terrible changes. As the organ fell from the choir loft to the nave, the battering, the heat, something, said it chiming, playing its sharps and flats in a fugue of its own creation. May you and I go down with such an explosion of music a song of songs. What an extraordinary moment that must have been. No one knows what caused the organ as it fell from one level to another to, to begin playing, but it did. And of course, the bells up in the belfry were caught in the terrible fire wind and were uh, swinging their, their hearts out. And there was all this music from, uh, from that dying cathedral. What a way to go down. We're back now to uh, the corner of Goodrich Road and Ferry Lane, where my neighbor was singing the moon and I was uh, speaking dog uh, a while ago. <clears throat> and uh, now it's fall. <clears throat> fall. October is the rasp of 10-inch catalpa leaves landing at my feet where I'm running the dog. He is all nose examines the fading scent of the neighbor's Labrador on pillar and post that the lab no longer waters. Wizard and I are lost in sad sensations, not ready for the wind of a ten-speeder rounding the bend and disappearing down the road. No hands, look, the biker is holding his long arms straight out, dipping them this way, that way, like any hawk and before he's gone for good, lifting them up, down, up, down, then higher, straight up in a V, he holds it, holds it. And finally, one from uh, Route 20 on the way to the airport where Mark's used parts exists. Uh, went, I went there for a windshield from my, uh, for my AMC Hornet. If you ever had a Hornet, you'll know. Things were always breaking. I didn't get the windshield, but I uh, did get a poem before they kicked me out for not having a hard hat. This is called Mark's Auto Parts. In come the wrecks to Mark's, and out the gear knobs, gas tanks, radiators, speakers, mufflers, bins of parts. The crummiest clunker is worth Mark's while. There's an avenue of front ends, Beatles, Buicks, Jags, a 49 Nash, an alley of chassis, a park of gutted bodies piled on one another like lovers. Everything has a future, all of which is very gratifying, a sign of what we'll amount to in the aftertime. The loose strife will take this, frogs, that. The earth will value our humus. The cardinal put us to use. Dismantled, we'll go far. So thank you so much for, for tuning in to poetry. You're brave people since poetry has a, a bad name in the world today because of all the terrible stuff that gets published in The New Yorker and elsewhere. 
but any, any fourth grader knows it's wonderful stuff. And I've uh, spent my uh, life joyfully uh, indulging in it. A couple of my books are, are here. Uh, this is the most recent one, The, uh, the Weathering, with a, with a wonderful uh, painting by Andrew Wyeth from the uh, Wadsworth Athenaeum on the front. I'm quite, uh, I, I love that, uh, that Wyeth. And I hope you will uh, come back uh, uh, each month to hear another of the Antrim House poets read her, her or his work, and occasionally we may have a memoir thrown in. And uh, we look forward to your uh, calling in, perhaps, uh, and, uh, or get you getting in touch with me, if you like. Uh, we, uh, we do uh, want you to relish poetry in the way it's relished in other countries, uh, where... Uh, Say in, uh, oh, in Chile, Pablo Neruda would read to a full soccer stadium full of people. Or in Russia, uh, Vazhnyshevsky would cross the uh, Siberian steppes and would be mobbed by people, some of them illiterate, who, uh, who wanted to hear him read. Of course, the Russian poets didn't just read. They danced on tabletops while they read and so forth. Poetry is, a, is like bread for the people in other uh, parts of the world. And uh, my hope is that... Uh, in my small way at Antrim House, uh, publishing uh, poets from here and elsewhere in the country and even abroad, actually, but mostly uh, from New England. Uh, we, can, uh, we can introduce you to poetry and make it uh, like bread uh, for everyone. Uh, so uh, goodbye, and uh, do come back uh, to hear the next poet. I wish I could tell you who it will be, but that, that's a surprise. You'll have to tune in, uh, and it will be shown uh, uh, several times uh, during the month and maybe even on Saturdays sometimes. So check Channel 5, your local access uh, Simsbury television station. And again, thanks to Ken Picard, my producer. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.